me Fighting for your civil rights Out on the cruel streets tonight For Sylvia and Marcia Life was harder than you ever know A silly place to start Where others just threw a stone I'm joined this morning by a good friend, James O'Hagan. Now, James is with LGBT Ireland. So, James, welcome to uh, LGBTQ Plus Life. Thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted to be able to chat to you. Yeah. James, uh, it's a couple of years since I was down at your building in uh, uh, Smithfield. Um, and we have had your CEO, Paula Fagan, on the mm -hmm. programme, but that was before LGBT Ireland came into existence. So perhaps can you just tell us a little bit about uh, what's the history of LGBT Ireland and why did you come into, why uh, did uh, LGBT Ireland come about? Yeah, absolutely. So, so LGBT Ireland, I suppose, it is sort of a it's a national collaboration between a number of regional organizations so obviously ireland was very, we're very lucky in that we have a lot of amazing kind of activists working specifically in in areas around the country and i suppose like we have the gay project in court out, out mm. west over in the, the west link in cork as well and these other groups outcomers up in drada all came together i suppose and they had been running or, or managing the national lgbt helpline uh, over mm. a number of years and they decided that like that having a i suppose an um an overarching body that managed this sort of national sort of view so that they could get on with the work in their regions and they feed into us as well and they still okay. are very involved at, at every point so i suppose it's it's sort of it's a it's a national collaboration of those views we started out i suppose the main part of what we were um the, the main portion of our work and the main part of our work was really about that 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 support offering that listening service through the helpline peer support services uh, and then we have moved more into into sort of advocacy and training so uh, we obviously work a lot with more marginalized people within the community travelers in roma older people people living in direct provision uh, homeless people more recently and and we also then would work a lot around kind of the the training needs that that different groups have and specifically around sort of health and social care training to try and make those services more accessible for members of our community yep it's interesting that uh, you should mention it because you mentioned uh, out west, you've mentioned outcomers in Drogheda uh, and various groups like that. Very much we're talking the same, uh, we're, we're certainly singing from the same hymn sheet here, James, because I've had these groups on over the last couple of months uh, and mm -hmm. I'm particularly keen on getting this program to be less focused on Dublin and more yeah. focused on the rest of the country as well. So would it be reasonable to describe LGBT Ireland as a type of hub for many of these, uh, and I mean a hub as a coordinating body for many of these organisations, the way you've described it? Yeah, ab absolutely. And I suppose like within our board um, and within the sort of the decision making that happens about the strategic goals and the the, the way that LGBT Ireland is, is sort of plans its future, it's always through collaboration with those regional bodies and with those groups, because we understand that there is a that there is a uh, there is a potential that that things can become, become very Dublin focused. And especially when there's so much amazing work happening around the country within these mm -hmm. organizations. I was lucky enough to get down to Cork for Cork Pride there and to see that the brilliant work that they're doing and to see even sort of you know i know clonmel pride was happening fairly recently and, and i know like you're seeing these groups really coming into their own and kind of creating spaces in in not traditionally sort of inclusive or accepting environments and sort of asserting themselves and, and you know i think it's it's very important that those voices are the voices that are heard when the national organization is making the decisions about where it needs to be going Mm -hmm. Well, you'll be delighted to hear, James, that uh, your name came up when I originally spoke to people from LGBT uh, in Cork. <laughs> uh, and well, they weren't always um, praising other uh, uh, elements of the community in Dublin. They were very, very praising of yourself. And they said, you've got to talk to James O'Hagan. He's doing great work and he's a, he's, a, he's a very staunch advocate for the community. So well done in that regard. Thank you very much. Always yeah. give you the compliments. Yeah. <laughs> I, is LGBT Ireland, uh, is it mainly an advice and uh, uh, 
information entity or do you have a funding capacity as well? That, or would you be more likely to put people in touch where they could get funding? Um, so we're, we're, I suppose, as every element of the NGO sort of sector is, we're out there trying to graft and get funding for the projects that we're working on. So we don't really have an, an enormous capacity to fund other projects, but we would collaborate and work with groups who are trying to figure out kind of like the direction they can. And we have obviously, like any sort of organization that's existed for a while, we have a ton of experience in sort of where to get funding from, how to get funding. So we are, I suppose we would work with, with organizations on sort of of how we can help them, but we ourselves don't offer any particular funding for, for, for initiatives around the country. As, as I suspect. Now, if I have a look at, particularly in the area of support you provide, James, you've got a helpline, you've got transgender family, uh, you've got chat services, peer support groups. These entities, or these services, they also exist within the wider community. Uh, is how would you put the coexistence? Is it seamless or is there um, uh, any sort of, uh, shall we say, territorial disputes? No, I, I mean, from my experience, obviously my, my role in LGBT Ireland, I'm, I'm a little bit separate to the services piece, but sure. just certainly from my experiences of, I suppose, hearing about how they run, it seems to all run in a really healthy collaboration. And I know that it's important to us that, say, for the helpline, the helpline is run by different groups and organizations around the country on different mm -hmm. nights so that we always have, you know, because it's important as well. If you're if you're a, 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 a gay man in rural Cork, you may not want to pick up the phone and hear a Dublin accent on the phone. So you want Indeed. to know that there's going to be, you know, the, the chance that you're going to hear a Galway accent or a Mayo accent or someone mm -hmm. who's kind of, you know, more representative of understanding of where you're coming from. So that's what we know that there, it needs to have that fully collaborative, fully sort of national um, element in it. Mm -hmm. yep. Now, moving on slightly, James, from the organisation to the personal, you wrote a very interesting piece a, uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago that I read, and I read it with interest in the sense that mm -hmm. you were talking about growing up in Ireland. Now, it wasn't necessarily growing up LGBT, but that was clearly central to it. But the issue you were talking about was body image and particularly mm -hmm. body shaming. Now, this is something I can identify with because uh, when I, until at least I was 50, um, I was what you would call a very skinny kid. Uh, mm -hmm. And when I, when I was young, uh, I was an extremely, you know, tall and skinny kid, so you stood out. Uh, I remember being horrendously, uh, uh, shall we say, to use a Dublin term, slagged for that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, no matter how much we try and brush it off, you become self-conscious about it, and it's something mm -hmm. you carry through life. Just share with people, what was your experience and how did you deal with it? Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose like you 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 said it you said it there very eloquently in that sort of well this wasn't necessarily an LGBT issue. Sort of the, the fact that I was overweight and that I've always been overweight is something that I I, I suppose has as you said you become self-conscious about it it's ingrained into you it starts to become it starts to to seep into how you feel about yourself and i suppose that and you know once you move into the the to the to, to the queer community there is a sort of a a premium particularly in the gay male community put on a very specific body type and as you said if you don't fit it on either end of the spectrum it can be a very sort of isolating place and you can really question your own value so i suppose for me it was important for me to use my voice to talk about this because over the last number of years I, I had been podcasting and, and through a podcast that I'd hosted called the Big Gay Bucket List I'd mm. spoken an awful lot about experiences I'd had about coming out about realizing I was gay about the fact that I sort of hadn't felt like I fit into the community like I'd felt like a bit of an outsider and a huge part of that was because of my weight because mm. I looked at these people and even I suppose I mentioned in the, the article that was, in representation of, of, of LGBT people uh, or LGBT men, it, it, there always was that idea that the sort of, you know, that, you know, the, the attainment of a perfect body was important to being mm -hmm. part of it. I mentioned about how I'd watched, say, Queer as Folk back in the year 2000. That was the first time I'd seen gay people represented on television. They mm -hmm. were all sort of, you know, had these like great bodies and they were all these skinny people. And the only time you saw bigger people represented, it was sort of as the butt of a joke. And so I felt like I didn't really belong. And that really hampered 
the the way in which I was able to um, that really hampered ha how I engaged with the community and how I was sort of able to to sort of build a, a, a community around myself. And it was only over the course of a number of years of really sort of like going back into this sort of whole question of my own value, of my own worth <laughs> and sort of, you know, through going on some really unhealthy diets, through going on, through getting into some really bad relationships that I started saying, you know, I, I need to stop and think about this. And it's when I started realizing that actually I'm the person who's setting my own value based on sort of what I feel other people think about me. And I had to shrug that off. It took me a long time. And even to this day, only two weeks ago, I was in a sports shop to buy, and, and I'm a very sporty person now. Mm. And I was in a sports shop to buy myself um, a, a new pair of shoes. And I got overwhelmed with that sense of being that 16 year old who would have felt like I didn't mm. belong in that space. Yeah. And I had that moment of having to catch myself. So it's something that keeps going through, but it's it's so important that we start talking about it more within the, the male spaces in the LGBT community. I mean, across all of the community, but particularly within the male spaces, because we need to be kinder to each other. We need to treat each other with more dignity and more respect. And we need to stop being so casual in the way we dismiss people's body images and the way we dismiss people or create assumptions about people based on the shape of their bodies. Because I, I've been in positions where by being a bigger person, I've had very negative assumptions made about me. I remember being in, in, in work. This is just after I left college. There was three people on the team out of 25 who were overweight. And one, one individual working on the team, sort of a, a woman who wasn't overweight, made complaints about each of us about bad hygiene. Now, it, you know, none of us had bad hygiene, but she made them, and her complaints were looked into and addressed, and we, and it was a form of bullying by her, and she targeted the three of us who were overweight, but no one said, why is it that you have, you know, you know what I mean? So that there is an assumption made around people and around kind of the, the attitudes that we're able to have towards people based on what society tells us to think. And that's what we need to start challenging and letting people know when they're coming into the queer community and into queer spaces, if they don't feel like they belong because of their body type, whether it's because they're too big, whether it's because they're too skinny, that that that, that this is a space for them. They're equally as wanted within the community. Yep. It's interesting you uh, you mentioned two things there, James: queer as folk and uh, and body image. Now, I go back to the eighties, uh, uh, which you weren't uh, when you weren't around, and I had a very good friend in Australia, and he was one of those worked out uh, uh, people. And he, what he said to me at the time was very interesting. And it's more it's a sin than queer as folk. Mm -hmm. The whole body image thing started in the late 80s, the, the going to gyms, p taking steroids and all of that, because yeah. that was the way you convinced other members of the community that you didn't have HIV. Isn't it? Isn't that, that a, is fascinating? Isn't and actually, it? I mean, I, 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 I yeah. absolutely makes sense. You yeah. want to display this like pinnacle of healthiness in your image, yeah. Yeah. so that people don't start judging you for or, or fearing you for yeah. being kind of yeah. That's 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 fascinating. Yeah, well, my 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 friend Michael, um, who was worked out and you know, and who really did have. Uh, the six pack and the uh, you know the uh, the you know the the bodybuilding image. He did yeah. have HIV, which is interesting. Yeah. So it was another way of disguising it. So um, yeah. uh, have just just on that one, James. One of my favourite subjects uh, of the year. Did you watch It's a Sin? I I absolutely did. I found <sighs> it so heartbreaking. I I've been uh, a, I mean I've I've been a fan of Russell T Davis over years. Uh, Obviously, we all have. He's done amazing yeah. things in representation of, of like authentic representation of queer people. But I I just thought that It's a Sin was another level for him. It was so beautiful, yeah. so yeah. well acted, and just like I I watched this with my with my mother who obviously. I suppose she would have been, you know, um, she was a young mother during the the eighties, and for her, like I suppose, her, all she had known about the AIDS epidemic, other than what she may have learned subsequently through having a gay son, was just around the mystery of it and the fear of it. Mm. And I just, it, I think it really broke her heart that she hadn't been able to do more. And I think if it touches those people who were there at the time outside of our community and helps them understand what life would like for us, it can only then make them more inclusive and wants to be more sort of outreach to, to make sure that they're including queer people and they're making us more part of their communities as well, which I think is, which is a really wonderful thing. Yeah, yeah no, um, I'll be honest, uh, my feelings were similar, except the slight difference is, is that because I was around when it was happening, 
it was almost like a documentary to people like me. Uh, you know, you started mm -hmm. with, I mean, I sat there watching it with people and we had tears streaming down our faces because yeah. of the people we knew who weren't here. And because just, we, you know, we, we were all saying, if only they had hung on for a few years and prep came along. And that's the yeah. tragedy of it, isn't it? Just on that one, James, because you did say LGBT Ireland uh, are involved in, in, uh, in training. That's something I would love to see schools uh, taking on board of watching that and getting people like yourself and people mm -hmm. people like Tony Walsh and people like uh, Panty who were around at that period and uh, explaining to them that this is the way it was because there are parallels with COVID as well, mm -hmm. the way we've responded. How do you feel about that? I think it's I think it's very important to look at the experiences of people in the past to and help us inform and become more inclusive into the future. I actually I'm I part of what I've my work in LGBT Ireland is more in the, the older people space and a particular interest of mine is helping people understand the experiences for LGBT older people who grew up in an Ireland which was very much less accepting and mm -hmm. um, I produced a, a podcast earlier in the year called Invisible Threads which was an interview based podcast with eight older members of the community sharing their stories and I've had a huge amount of younger people who've listened to that reaching out to me saying that they they actually couldn't believe some of what they were hearing the stories mm -hmm. of people going to state sanctioned conversion therapy people having yeah. to like run away from home to live in other countries because of their identities and this is coming as sort of news to them so it's very important that people are educating themselves on where we've come from we've made amazing social progress uh, in the in the last while and we've we've done amazing work in making ireland like a real shining star in the world of of, of lgbt inclusion but that is so quickly lost if we don't keep a mind on where we have been and where we are coming from Yep. On that very point, James, the <clears throat> you and I, we caught up recently uh, at a, uh, a protest against the repressive legislation in Hungary. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we don't have enough time to talk about that today, but how important do you think it is that uh, particularly Ireland, where we, as you say, we are a shining light into LGBT uh, uh, rights, um, we know, we know the same thing is happening in Russia. We know it's happening in Poland. Uh, we don't even dare think about Afghanistan and some of the other places. But uh, using uh, Hungary as the example, how important do you think it is that people take on board and show solidarity with oppressed uh, uh, communities in these countries? Well, I think there's, there's two things in that. And the first is very much that it is... It is <laughs> by us showing solidarity with the people in those countries, which is so important for us to do because we need to let people know that there is a better place, that, that, that what's the, the, the it, it gets better campaign. People need to hopefully be able to see that there are places in the world where they're valued, their identity is valued, who they want to be is valued, and, and that they can hopefully aspire to make or bring around the changes or get to those places where they can finally be safe. And, and shouting loudly about that here is very important. It also says to our government and it says to the the, the European Parliament, these are important issues. This isn't something you can sweep aside. This isn't something you can ignore. But on a, on, on a more sort of, you know, basic nationalist level or more basic national level, it, it also starts to challenge what we're seeing in the growing trend of, of, of sort of like issues of like hate crime and homophobia coming about in Ireland. We've seen that over the course of the last number of months. We've sat here talked about the great progress that's been, that, that, that has happened in Ireland over the past couple of months. But We've also seen rainbow flags burnt in uh, in, 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 in Sligo, uh, in Waterford. <laughs> exactly. We've seen people handing out leaflets. We've seen obviously a growth in, in, in very worrying sort of dialogue around the trans community. I mean, when oh I was in Cork for Cork Pride, a group of teenagers walked by us outside Chambers Bar and started shouting slurs at us, which isn't something that oh. I think you would ever have experienced. And I think that by I, I think part of that is because we haven't had big visible pride parades that haven't been that place where we've been able to come together and have that moment of recognition but i do think as well that there is a growing trend in sort of in in, in exclusion or using homophobia and using that sort of exclusion to in, in ways that it was in the past and we need to be very very active in challenging that and part of that is challenging homophobia when we see it and transphobia when we see it around the world yeah, well, the very worrying development, James, which uh, I'm sure you've read about as I have, is uh, LGBT assaults, particularly in the UK. There's been some very, very nasty ones in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> 
No, absolutely. And you see people walking home from, you're seeing a, a worrying, you're right, like a really worrying trend in sort of, you know, people just walking home from gay bars hand in hand, or even just leaving gay bars hand in hand. And that's bringing you back to that place of kind of where you would have to sort of run out the door of the George to get as far down Georgia Street as you could to, before you'd walk carefully again back to that period of time. We don't want to go back there. We like there, there's a beautiful interview with Panty from the day after the marriage equality referendum where she spoke about kind of seeing gay people walking around Dublin city center, holding hands and that feeling of kind of like this collective exhale of like, oh, we can be ourselves and we're safe here. We need like th this, what we're seeing at the moment is a real sense of that's not permanent. And if we don't fight for it, we're going to lose it. Yeah, yeah. well, um, going back to uh, what we were talking about of um, Russell T Davis, again, when I was in Sydney in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the uh, 80s when HIV kicked in, there had to be LGBT vigilantes because uh, people were getting bashed up. So particularly uh, uh, there was a group called the Lesbian Avengers, which used to go around with whistles. Um, and <laughs> that was one way of alerting people yeah. um, and bringing solidarity. We would hope we don't go down to that as well. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, James, the one that uh, uh, the major issue uh, we wanted to uh, hear from you today, you're in the, uh, uh, involved with the LGBTQ uh, Champions Programme at uh, LGBT Ireland. Tell mm -hmm. us about that and uh, what it entails. So I suppose when, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, LGBT Ireland looked into sort of advocacy for marginalised groups within the community and how we could help those people feel more included and, and access the services that they need. And when it came to the needs of older members of our community, it was apparent that there's a, a disparity when it comes to health and access to health services. There's a fear sometimes within older members of the community that they can't be out with healthcare providers, particularly if it's home help, people coming into their spaces, or if they're going into nursing homes so we developed this training program which is part which sort of uh, which is open to health and social care professionals working in supporting older people services or working in those services mm -hmm. that older people would more often access and it, it is a a four-hour training training program that then makes you part of a network so we've heard 150 oh champions trained champions working in around 90 services all over the country instituting changes making paperwork more inclusive training people on how to be more sensitive in talking to people and it's been it's it's a, a one you can find into it there's information on the lgbt ireland website if you want to read more about it with the uh, just lgbt Dash champions program go on to you'll find it there anyway but um the the amazing thing about this work is hearing from health and social care professionals who hadn't maybe thought of this as an issue who now are starting to have service users or patients coming out to them revealing their identity to them some of them for the first time ever and it you know particularly that it's having an impact for these people because these are people who in many cases have held the secret in them have maybe only ever come out to one or two people in their entire life and they carry this fear with them. I have there's a there's a, a particular individual who who I, I would know quite well now through we during COVID we established a, an online support group for older members of the community and through that I got to know several uh, older people who had issues and one guy told me this mm -hmm. story about how he was recovering from cancer and required home help and <laughs> the person who was coming in to um and the person who was coming in to I suppose care for him in very intimate ways was quite gruff and aggressive and and sort of in the initial kind of meeting was very much like where's your wife why aren't you married and he said he spent the next kind of the next however long he needed to engage with that person like before they would come over he would be hiding rainbow flags hiding pictures of him and his ex-partner and if you're undergoing treatment for cancer the last thing you need to be worrying about is what ornaments are sitting on your your um your, your fireplace sure. when someone's coming to help you so we need to make sure that people who are going into those spaces when people are in when people are in need of intimate care and are very vulnerable that they are able to meet the person where they need to be met in other words, they got to see the person rather than see some sort of uh, predefined image. Exactly, exactly, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, for anybody who might want to get involved in that, James, how would they? Uh, what would be the best approach? Do you approach them, or should they be uh, uh, able to approach you guys? So, so it's working both ways. I'm I'm reaching out to to, to managers within the HSC, to people within nursing homes, to any services we know that are regularly accessed by older people. I'm reaching out to try and start that dialogue. But equally, 
we want people to contact us. You can email me james at lgbt.ie to ask more about the program, to get the application form. We've got a, a three dates coming up for the training over the next uh, over the next three months. Um, and we'll have we have network events for people to come to and we'll have an online sort of resource center that we're setting up at the moment. So it really is, I suppose, a um, it, it's a it's a space to come into to help you continue learning and continue growing your understanding of the needs of older members of the community. It's very collaborative and LGBT Ireland are always there to work with you. And one of the, I suppose, the key things that we've seen since we started this training in, in this health sphere is that the knock on impact within services where staff and other people have felt more confident to come out. We've seen it transform the, the approach to care for LGBT people across the board in some services, which, you know, which, which is amazing to see because you're starting to see that rainbow lens applied to the health service across the board and stopping this kind of like somewhat narrow minded feeling that the only access to care that LGBT people need specifically is around sexual health. We need our identity respected wherever we go within the, the, the health service. And we need to know that when we're vulnerable, someone is going to be understanding of, of who we are and why our identity is important to us. Yeah, And particularly as over the last 18 months or so, uh, people have not been able to get out and meet. They haven't been able to get out to uh, the familiar venues. They haven't been able yeah. to catch up with friends, which is... Uh, disproportionately i think not only if it impacts the lgbt community but particularly the older lgbt community who may have lost touch with family and certainly would probably have lost quite a few of the friends they grew up with mm -hmm. yeah no absolutely and i think that's research already showed us prior to covid that older members of the LGBT community were that bit more isolated and were that bit more lonely. And they sort of, you were right, tended not to have those traditional family supports and didn't have like large friend networks for, for many reasons. So the loss then of those outlets that, that were there over the last 18 months has resulted in like for everyone, but perhaps slightly more acutely for people who are additionally marginalized, sort of mental health issues, loneliness issues, isolation issues. And so we need to make sure that we're providing services to these people, particularly now that they're in a very vulnerable place, that they know that they can be themselves and don't need to be sort of hiding who they are in order to get important help for themselves. Yeah. Just uh, finally, James, because we're going to run out of time, but the last time I was down with LGBT Ireland, you had been running a, uh, a one-day event about people in direct provision, particularly LGBT, and that's how I met uh, our great friend Evgeny. Um, yeah. And something that I, was, uh, I wasn't aware of and I was shocked when I found it out that somebody uh, who may be LGBT put into direct provision, like somewhere like Mosny or anything like that, they can be put into a living accommodation with people who are out and out homophobic. Um, now, I know that your organization uh, was very concerned with that. Is there anything positive that you can uh, report back on that one? Or is the situation still as bad as ever? <laughs> Uh, the situation is improving gradually. Obviously, there's a commitment to get rid of uh, of um, of direct provision. And, and um, my colleague, Coletta Regan, she works with our support group, it's Rainbow Meach, which is a peer support group for, for LGBT people living in direct provision. She's been doing amazing work. They, they released an animation to really highlight the mental health impact of exactly that, of going into a setting of you know, where you have fled your, uh, your, your, your country of origin as a result of your identity and now find yourself surrounded by other people who are equally as aggressively opposed to you as who you are. So I'm not going to speak on that because I don't know myself. Colette, sure. It would have all of the facts, but I can tell you, we are we are positively disposed to what we're hearing the government planning around direct provision and we're hoping that they they maintain those commitments and that they actually do follow through on sort of not only ending direct provision but allowing safe passage for for L members of the lgbt plus community so that people who come here as part of that fleeing that discrimination aren't put back with people who will discriminate against them yeah james it's been uh, a, a, a a great experience and an informative experience talking with you today we look forward to catching up again in person as as we get back to the new normal so james o'hagan all our good friends in lgbt ireland thank you for being our guest today thank you very much for having me okay friends of dorothy come out off the sidewalk and onto the street to the sound 
Oh. 